Today, Madeline teaches us the difference between PR and marketing. Stick around. Welcome back, everybody, to today's episode of Clicks and Bricks. My name is Ken. Today we have Adeline, or Madeline Elizabeth. Uh, she has recently written a book that's going to be coming out here shortly, and she's got a very interesting background story with a lot of different businesses and a lot of different skill sets. But before we jump in and bring her in, if you'd like to join my text line community, 314-370-2871 is my text line. It's my personal text line. You can ask me any question about business or technology, and I will give you an unbiased opinion on, on how I would move forward. I don't charge at all for that service at all. If you do join my text line community, I will send you one or two texts a month. It's going to be tips, tricks, motivation, and every now and then, some crypto news. But let's jump right into today's show. How are you doing today, Madeline? Good. Everyone has to bring up the crypto news right now. Yeah, you know, I've been in crypto for a very long time, um, and I, I got out of it mostly out of it in 2017, which was a gigantic mistake um, financially. But uh, <laughs> I am back in, and it's a hobby of mine. It's not. I'm not nearly as as deep as I was back in 2013 and 14. But um, I do keep my finger on that pulse a little bit, and uh, Elon definitely keeps it interesting. For sure. For sure. <laughs> so, um, fantastic. Uh, Madeline, can you tell us a little bit about your company, where you're currently at, and just a little bit about your background? Yeah. Um, so, I started in fashion and politics. I decided in 2011, I was working a lot of jobs. I had a lot of, I was an independent contractor, and I needed something to make my life easier for tax purposes. I started a company, had no clue what I was, <laughs> what I was doing. Uh, it led to me starting another company, um, which had a successful, I ex made an exit in 2017 with, um, fast forward. Now that company still exists, the MV line. Um, we are a PR marketing crisis management firm. Um, we've been around for about 10 years. Um, and after, and within those 10 years, a lot has happened, changed. And I, I'm now working, um, just finished my book, A Mess and Address, and I'm launching my personal website, coaching, and uh, brand. Um, it was supposed to launch before COVID, and we put, I put it off because my clients needed me. People needed me during COVID more than, and it did not seem like the right time. So now we are here, and it's time to get that back and started, and that's what I'm working on now. So you talked about the tax services and you formed an LLC so that all those vendors could pay that one LLC. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the decision and the process? Did you use like an online service to do that or did you go to a lawyer? So no, I, I had a C, I went to a CPA actually and CPA okay. helped me with all of that. I decided to do it because I was in fashion. I was working in fashion as a model. I was uh, in college and then I was a millennial who understood the marketing itself, social media, and I wanted to go into PR. And so I started working for a realtor. I started working for a financial firm. I was working all around internship co-op and it turned into like contract jobs as I met people. And I was, I needed something to bring these connections also together because a lot of them, I would be like, wow, you should meet this person. I was like a sponge and they were, they loved it because I was connecting people. And that's really been the key to my success has been able to connect with others on all scales. And, um, so next thing I knew, I was like, this has become too much. I need a way to, um, bring it all together. I knew women made money in pharmaceuticals and I knew you could make your own schedule. So for two years, I, um, I interned for a year and then I, um, for two years, I was a medical sales territory manager, um, which is what I put all that money aside and I um, invested in my company. And um, that's what led me to being able to hire people um, to help me with the contracts and help me getting more, become more official. Right. So um, you're a hundred percent bootstrapped. You never yeah. raised capital. Fantastic. That's, capital. Congratulations. I love that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I like, I don't mind VC money either, but I I definitely bootstrap way more than I go to VCs. Um, well, it's just more it's more fun. I saw I you know the one thing I saw was at the time a lot of people college kids were coming out of college they didn't really know 
what to do. Big companies were struggling with the new marketing landscape because social media was coming into play. Um, and that's when the startup communities were, like I said, built. Um, and I saw a lot of people starting startups. They were playing with someone else's money and they had no concept of really how much money they were playing with. And they were being taught to build a business basically to have it acquired. And then these founders would leave the companies and they would not know what to do. And they didn't really have any real world experience with budgeting their own or playing with their own money. And right. seeing that only further made me want to stay away from it, um, which now I, I work with a lot of investment firms, hedge funds to help. I bring them client, I bring them projects or I'm a part of their invest, you know, what they invest in. Um, but yeah, I just, I really wanted to do it on my own. <laughs> right. So I'm going to throw you under, under the bus a little bit here. I'm going to give you a tough question to answer for the audience. You said PR firm, crisis management, and all those things. And we've touched on marketing a little bit. And I think the two PR and marketing get confused very frequently. Can you help the audience understand what the difference between a PR person and a marketing person might be, right? Because they are different, but I think they're, I think PRs, in a, especially in the small business world, frequently left out. It's so... I, number one, I'm glad you asked this question because it's something I touch on in my new, on my new website and in blogs. Um, and I talk about a lot. People come to me and they want, so when I saw the marketing landscape changing, I was fascinated by it. And that's when I started really studying digital PR. At the time I was interning for another big, large firm for PR. And I realized they, they weren't getting results for their clients because at the time working in advertising and PR, you see that these companies are going digital. So all these places and magazines, nobody's reading magazines anymore. And <clears throat> a lot of times these magazines are being bought by companies and they're, you know, what used to be a thick magazine, now they're this thing, you know, and it, they changed because everything's digital. So I started really studying digital marketing um, because digital marketing, you can measure. You can measure, there's KPIs. With PR, there is not the problem now is I get clients and they're like, well, I want to, I want to know how many placements you can secure. PR is earned media. That is about building relationships with journalists, the media companies, even people like yourself for my clients to have interviews and get that airtime right. um, and have their story out there. It is earned media. I cannot legally tell my client, I can get you five different placements guaranteed by next week. That's, that's unheard of. Our right. job and from the day one in traditional PR is you, you know, you, you put together a pitch, press release, you know, a story and you send it to journalists that you think would um, work with your client. And then marketing is about sales. It's about numbers. And I think the one thing that I, that really um, had me bridge a gap and helped me get to where I am was I saw that the PR was not working. And I started really studying digital PR and how we should be, I think for every marketing campaign, I am able to create also a small PR campaign for clients. And it really, they coincide well, um, cross marketing, staff marketing, however you want to put it. Um, they really, they pair well together. Um, and if you can do that, that's what these big corporate companies, they can afford. So right. what I've tried to do with some of these small, smaller companies or companies that are right there in the middle of the road, they're, they're finally not a small company, but they're stuck because they can't make, you know, the money to beat these bigger, larger corporations. Right. I've tried to help with creating smaller PR, digital PR campaigns that can pair well with their SEO strategies and their, you know, their, their marketing and their blogs, because there's very, they're very different. Um, and that's the biggest problem is a lot of people think PR um, that I can give them an exact number of how many placements. And I, I don't believe that that's real or like, right. you know, honest. So I've got a couple of questions here on there. The first one is going to be, so in marketing, it's kind of easy to think about on your KPIs. If I'm doing a video view ad, I want video views and that's my, that's my direct intent. If I'm doing a lead capture, I want email address and phone number. And if I'm doing a sales campaign, then I want a customer at the end of that. What are some of the like top two or three KPIs that you might want to do? And you said one of them on placement when you're doing a PR campaign, what are the top two to three 
KPIs that you would want to track outside of obviously placement? With PR? Um, like, with PR, right? Yes. Yeah, because okay. marketing, like, it's a little more, it's not as subjective with PR, with marketing, right? Because you know, if I run this ad, it's a video ad, I can tell how many times it's been viewed. If I run a bad that's a conversion ad, I can tell how many times it's been converted. If I run an ad that's a lead capture, I can tell how many leads I got. So I, it's very easy. My right. tit for tat, my ROI is very, very clear or should be in a marketing campaign. If you're being sold a marketing campaign that's not very clear on what success looks like, run. Right. Go the other direction. Don't buy it from that person, right? You want to know what success looks like. And you want to have a partner that's going to talk about those things with you, not hide those things from you. But on the PR side, placement's one of them. Do you have specific KPI objectives for each PR campaign that you put out? Or is there kind of some standards that are in play? Every, so every client's different because every client, okay. can, um, depending on their industry or, you know, what size their company is, really um, the retain, you know, what their retainer looks like or what their budget, I would say, looks like the most part. Um, I always tell people it's really hard to work on a, a lot of PR, we like retainers because it's, it's hours of pitching and it's hours of putting those ideas together and sharing them. Um, but they, a lot of people want, um, they want us to earn it. They want those placements. They want them secured because they've been burned before by other people. Right. Um, so when it comes to PR, I like to say, Two, I like to always say we try to do two placements. My goal is to always do two placements. Um, I like to always have um, one being for sure magazine, um, you know, like for the holidays, if they're a product, a gift guide, a placement, you know, um, maybe a story. And then more so um, I would like them to do something like TV or radio, media, podcast, because then they're talking there. There's content for them. And whatnot, but then there's outreach. So I call it outreach, which I do PR with marketing for the reason being of you have to do outreach. You have to talk about your client, right? You're already pitching the stories. So what I like to do is run outreach campaigns and I like to put together. So with that, I can, I can say, I like to run one different, I like to do test outreach. I do test marketing on all of my clients, just like all PR publicists, they do market research. They do, you know, listening they look at what journalists are really picking up on those stories. Um, I do very similar things, but I really cross marketing and PR right now. However, I make it very known in my proposals. There's a huge difference. And a lot of companies are coming to you and they're going to say, Hey, I can get you an, I can get you an article in Forbes for $300. I can get you, you know, for a thousand dollars, you can be on ABC market watch, whatnot. But they're not on the front of page of ABC. They're right. on like, or on Fox. They're on like some little city Fox. But what the, what that person are saying about the image is you can then put it on your website that you've been on Fox. But have you been on Fox? That is what I tell my clients is you have to realize there's a difference between advertisement, marketing, and PR. And, and statistics. Fox. And <laughs> the numbers. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a fact. And so I highly recommend reading the book. It's it's an old book, but how to lie with statistics. I think everybody should read it. If you're in the marketing world, you should definitely if you're buying anything in this world, you should be buy you should read right. that book because it's it's a scary world when you learn how to lie with statistics. Um that anyway, so. don't lie. I, that's the one thing I always say with my job too, is right. I check um I check empathy at the door a lot of one thing media is very emotionally driven. Um, that kind of really puts me more in marketing too, is I really check empathy at the door because I have to, because I see clients struggling sometimes and I have to make the right calls. I think we have to protect our clients. Uh, PR is all about also protecting reputation management for our clients and our Im their image. Um, and so, you know, when I look at things, I think PR cam campaigns, you can try to hit, it really depends on every client. But you can say, I'm going to run a campaign every week and you can optimize those PR campaigns and do outreach for PR. Um, right. You can do events and numbers. Like I made a goal that for this client, we would do get nailed on two partnerships because I knew this client is ready and there for partnerships. So I knew I could make that. I also, I, I do a lot before I sign or deal, take on any client. I do a lot of market research. 
And I make about three phone calls. Like I said, networking has been the key to my success. I call upon my partners, my, you know, my network to say, Hey, I have this person or this company. What do you think? And I see if I can, what the feedback is. That way I know how hard it's going to be to pitch. I know how hard it's going to be to get those placements, those partnerships. Um, Where with marketing, I don't really have to do that. I kind of know um, because it's, it's more, it's more number driven. It's more entering the right thing in the system and timing. Um, Very different. Okay. So. That, that's where you've been in the past. You've just okay. written the book, or you didn't just write the book. It was supposed to launch pre-COVID or right yeah. around COVID at time. You made the decision to wait until this year, and you're going to relaunch in February this year. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? I love the title, but I think it probably deserves a little bit of description. So Mess in a Dress is all about growing up. My mom always said, you have to put the dress on. Like I'm the oldest of four girls. We came from a chaotic, big family. And no matter if you are crying, having the worst day, my mom always said, put the dress on and you go, you have to show up, you have to do, you know, go to the event, go to school, whatever it is. And so the whole thing is I do PR. So I always started the company, like I said, I never intended to. I had no clue what I was doing. I was also 20 years old. So imagine a 20 year old with her whole life ahead of her. Um, I had all the, with all the possibilities, I had no idea how to keep them. Opportunities in the world, no idea how to keep them. I was just figuring it out day by day. And so I, there was a lot of messes and I made a lot of mistakes. And so I got so good at cleaning up my own messes growing up and as a young entrepreneur that I decided to make a living out of it. And I was like, if I can clean up my own messes that are huge, I can definitely help clean up other companies. Um, and so I put a dress on companies. And then I also strip companies because a lot of times with, it really depends on where the company is at. If companies have been around for years, then they've, this dress has a lot of accessories, a lot of pins on it, a lot of different detail. Um, but they forgot the core. They forgot what really, where they started, what made them who they are. And they kind of get lost with all these different avenues they've taken over the years. So a lot of times we do have to go down, we have to strip companies, clients down. Um, you know, even with newer entrepreneurs or brands, they have all these ideas. You have to take away all these layers and these things that they come to the table with and get to that main point. And so, and then I redress them. And that's the whole point of a mess in a dress is um, me talking about all the, the messes I've made and how I learned to have to put a dress on myself and what really led me into the career I'm in, which will help people know the, uh, the, my website launches uh, for the amount of Elizabeth. And that's where it's more about my business, me as a business and entrepreneur rather than just the business side of everything, um, what I'm doing now. Um, Fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about you and I'm again because you've got a marketing PR background. I, I I feel like I can put you on the spot a little bit here Fine. on some of these questions that I think people need to hear. Um, when you named your book a mess in a dress, and you're specifically helping companies either pivot, grow, change, overcome hurdles, whatever it is, you chose a name that really, you know, a, a 45 year old man probably not going to pick that book up unless they really dive into it. Can you tell us a little bit about your process when you decided, because you definitely geared it towards a female business owner, or the name definitely tends that way, right? Did you do that intentionally to empower women business owners, or was that just really a reflection of you? It's a reflection of me. And okay. number one, uh, one thing when early on when I was in my 20s, somebody said, um, we talk, you know, I talk about adversity, and I was a young female entrepreneur. And it took a lot. It's taken like a decade of working around the clock, you know, and dedication and sacrifice to get to where I'm at today. And I still have a long way to go. But I think the biggest thing for me is sex sells. And I think a lot of people with being a female, they were afraid to talk about being dressy or being young. And and I, you know, I never, I'm not, I'm all about girl power. And, you know, 
but pushing the whole feminism thing I, that wasn't that's not the whole thing it was more so with the messenger dress it, it's a reflection of me and i think when i go in there i always tell people you who you are how you present yourself that says something about you you know right. if you show up wearing um sports you know a sports hat i'm gonna think you're a dodger fan or you know a Steeler fan or whatever right. you are and so i always love dresses and i've always but I've always loved sports, but I putting on a dress and heels, I think it, it defines showing up and being someone for me. And so that's really how I came up with that. And, um, for men, it, you know, this story is more about me and my message, like making these messes and all the hurdles I've had to overcome. Um, and it leads into the website, the Madeline Elizabeth. So men would, I would think more be drawn toward the business side of it. Right. Um, but I think it's important. It's an important story to tell. And, um, you know, that's just what I did. Right. I decided to make it about so, myself. Yeah. I have a whole lot of these core values and, and things in my life. And one of them is be authentic. Right. And when yeah. I'm in marketing, you have to come up with your, 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 primary persona of the client that you want to sell to and your title and all those things should be really geared toward them. But more importantly than your client's persona is your persona. So if you're authentic in everything you do, then you'll just attract the clients to you that, that appreciate what you're doing, right? You don't have to go out. If you're knocking on doors and you're hustling to try to sell something and you're getting a bunch of no's, you're doing something wrong, right? You're either not being authentic, you're, you're trying to sell the wrong product or, or something along those lines. But most be, before your customer persona and you really try to change yourself to meet your customer's persona before you do that make sure that you're being authentic and you're being yourself and you're putting you out there because you are what's different than everybody else and that will attract your clientele right. to you right and so I that, say that's that, and sorry Dave, but i and i say that all the time because i say like when i was younger and starting i couldn't hide that i was 20 years old i couldn't hide that i was young Right. And, uh, you know, a young female with not a clue where I was going, but I knew I was on to something. And right. all I knew was I was working really hard and that something great would come of it. Right. Um, yeah. And but you can't hide the facts. The facts were I was 20 years old. I was a young female entrepreneur. And so I was like, I just and I you can't really change your personality. And so I was like, I just need to own who I am. And so, yeah. and I've always told, and that's by being authentic. And I've always told companies, if you own who you are, when you are in a bind, when you do make a mess, those clients, those people, your peers, they can't hold it against you because you've already owned who you are. They know this is what you are. And right. so I will never say that I am this like perfect, you know, even though I'm in PR and I put on the stress and people had always perceived me to be, you know, had my shit together underneath that dress, it was a mess. <laughs> like my life looked disastrous. Right. And so I think it was a, it's an important story to tell all around. Even if a guy wears a suit and he, you know, he, whether he's a, works at a top firm downtown or, you know, he's a multimillionaire, it doesn't matter what they wear because underneath their life can be a disaster. Their personal life can be a disaster. And, this whole book talks about all the different adversity, the different things that come into play and how I tackle it and how I just basically own it. And I take that on to really build a business. And right. yeah, so. Yeah, I have a, in my career, I have a little bit of reputation and I'm a little rough and tumble, right? So in corporate America, I tend to be the bulldog and I'm trying to get rid of that because I don't like it anymore. But um, so definitely, you know, who you are, play to your strengths and you'll, yeah. you know, most likely find success in that career. Right. So I, I, I like that, that, you, that you went to you first and then, Hey, this will attract my customers to me. And you just, just said, Hey, you know what? I understand that the majority of people out there that run businesses are men. I'm still going to name it. I'm still going to be me and, and yeah. really push that. And that's fantastic because I think in today's world, I love I'm not super happy with where we're at in the world today, but I do love the direction that we're headed. And, and women like you are the ones that are pushing that envelope and hopefully making, you know, a more fair world for my daughter who's 14 now and is going to be entering the, you know, workforce 
and probably two years because she's got to work for one of our companies, I'm sure. But, um, you know, it, and making sure that equality is something that we're going to be getting or, or that we at least continue moving towards it. Right. And that's it takes strong, independent women that are going to say, I don't need permission from anybody. I'm going to go start this business. I'm going to figure it out and move forward. And I, and I thank you for doing that. And, it, and it's it's a huge inspiration to hopefully a lot of young women and hopefully you're mentoring a couple of women behind you to help them follow in those footsteps as well. So before we go into the next step, I just want to thank you for doing everything that you've done. I know it's not always easy. Uh, um, I appreciate and, that. <laughs> right. So. But I will say that I always say the generation, my generation gave me a bad reputation. I've always been, <laughs> um, <laughs> I've always acted older, had a lot of older friends and been well beyond my years. But um, the one thing I can tell everyone is I think right now, you're talking about your daughter. I have three younger sisters. I look at our culture and our society, and that was another reason a mess and dress is so important to me. And launching this website is I have a lot of younger sisters and their friends that looked up to me. And I can't imagine what they're going through right now because I do think this, there are so many, social media is telling us to be, there's a new campaign every day. There is new ideas every day. And everyone is really being put in boxes and you're, you're having, and being in PR has been frustrating because they want me to be a part of ev- an activate, an activist for every campaign. And you can't be, you, you know, what? I, I can't support every movement. I can't, you know, I can't go down that road. And I tell clients, if that doesn't match your brand, you really shouldn't put something out there about it because you're gonna, you're gonna have to be walked back from it anyway. You're gonna have to walk back from it anyways, eventually. Um, Absolutely. And that was one thing during COVID I tried really nailing with some of the clients that were like, we have to push, you know, this, or we have to, you know, really say we support this. And and I said, but do we, because you're going, then you're a small business that is already looking at a budget. Do you really want to put your time and budget towards something that doesn't really, that's not your market. And it's not in, and in two weeks, there will be a different campaign and something different. And I, and I worry for females and young entrepreneurs who are, they look at the woke culture, they look at the society that we're in right now, and they're like, will this fit in a box or will I be told, will I be canceled? Will I be told I can't do it? And that's when I will tell you that a lot of people thought what I was doing is crazy. If I were, if I listened to everyone who, um, I was canceled a long time ago. We'll just put it that way. Um, yeah. So, and I tell people, you just got to keep pushing because that's all in your head. And I don't care what people say, own who you are. Absolutely. Great. Fantastic advice. And I love that you not only say it, but you live that, that mantra as well. So, Very much so. Yeah, absolutely. So if you had to, if you had a CEO or a founder of a company who was really struggling, you know, either financially or getting employees or something like that, and he's just ready to throw in the towel. And he's facing all these different kinds of adversity. If you had one tip or trick to help him overcome that adversity or at least deal with that daily stress, even if it's a trick tip in his personal life or his business life, what would that be? Or hers. Doesn't matter. Him or her. I use him as a gender it's neutral term. personal life? Well, because I, I feel like in business, you have to have a work-life balance. Yeah. And, and a lot of times what I've found when I, you know, I talk to thousands of business owners on a, reg, on a regular basis or not, not every day, but um, over years, I talk to thousands of people. And I always find that when they're struggling in their business and you really start talking to them, those struggles are falling over into their home life and sure. compounding it, compounding the, the business as well. Right. So I, I don't believe that you can run a successful business as an entrepreneur or a founder if you're having significant home life issues as well, right? That you that you're going to bring those into the office every day, right? So, I I really firmly believe that to run a successful business, you have to have a really good work life balance, right? Well, so, your attitude. I mean, if you if you if you wake up and you're fighting with your significant other, or you're you're in a poor environment, you come right. to work and you're you're already in a bad mood. You know, the one thing I know is being what I do can be very stressful. You have to find a way to decompress, um, to find the calm and the chaos because yep. I thrive in chaos. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> I love chaos. I love numbers. We might be I too love... similar at that. Yes, I love that. <laughs> but 
then I come home and I'm, I can be still really wired up or I can be, you know, have a long day. How do I take that away? I think the one thing is, is I, I love sports, playing sports in high school. I get on a treadmill and I run. Um, and I tell everyone, put your earphones in. And other than music, I don't get on my phone. You need time away. I also, you know, people live on their cell phones and I definitely am one to do as well. You have to put your phone down in a different room and give yourself like that out, like 30 minutes to check out. Like you have to find a way to check out. And other ways is like going for a hike or I always say wide open spaces inspire me. So going for a hike or going to, if you live near a beach, a lake, a body of water, something that really can calm you, go shop. If it, if that's what makes you, you have to get out of this, what you're, this mood you're in and just realize that nothing you can do in this moment can change anything. And right. that's one of the hardest things for me is when I'm in a bind with clients or I'm stressed, I'm like, I have a hundred things to do, but I need to be present in my house right now. I need to be home. How, or in my relationship, how do I do that? You need to take that time away, that 30 minutes and say, and when you take that 30 minutes, you'll realize nothing you're going to do is going to change anything at all. And it's even like when I, I mean, I've been up a lot four or five in the morning working, but there comes that nail where you're working on like proposals or you're working on like, you know, files, whatever it is you're working on. And you're like, um, I'm not getting anywhere right now. I'm just moving a mouse around to <laughs> like at this point, you have to really look at like quality versus quantity and take yourself out. Um, and you also need to find a home, create a home life and have a partner or, you know, your family and friends that really support you because Absolutely. that makes a big difference too. Right. You said, put your phone down. And I talk about this occasionally. Um, the, in my adult life, one of the most significant moments in my life was the first time that I put my phone and I was 40 years old. The first time that I turned my phone off as an adult and put it in a locker for a full hour, right? That was a significant moment in my adult life because it had never happened since I was 20 years old. I've been in a high paced industry for shoots my entire, since I was probably 15, I've been running pretty high paced more than one job. And I've never put my phone down because that's where opportunities come, right? And I'm like, well, I can't miss an opportunity. So I've always got my phone on and that's also where danger is alerted. You know, I get my danger alerts on my phone too. So, um, you know, I was so attached to it. And the, when I put it away for an hour, it was a scary hour for me. Like it was, it was a big mental just push. And now, you know, I probably go three or four hours a day now that my phone is off in, in a locker and I'm off doing other things. And I get by doing that now because I have trust in my team that they're going to take care of whatever problems might arise or they're going to execute. Hopefully I know that they'll take care of any problems. They'll probably leave any opportunities for me to execute when I get back into the office. But, um, we're, we're getting them up to speed on executing on opportunities as well. So, um, I think that's great advice. Find time for yourself. I, I find boxing is my outlet. You like to run like outdoor to spaces. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, whatever it is for you, make sure that you find that outside because you're bringing all kinds of negative energy into the office. If you're not doing that, if you're not taking care of yourself first, then you're not taking care of your company either. Right. You might think that you are working those long hours and all those things, but I promise you, you'll be wildly more efficient and more effective if you take that time for yourself. And there's always going to be crunch times where you're in that 72 hour push and you're just crunching to get the deadline. Right. But your eyes that's, are red. That, you're, you haven't right. slept. That, you that's not what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking but, about the daily grind of just every day. Like, what do you do? What yeah. is your routine? And you have to find space in that routine for you personally. So well, you also like, I feel like if you have a lot of clients or whatever you do in business, you know, the one thing is uh, it's never repetitive, even though day to day is right. you're always doing something different and tackling different situations. And you can't truly problem solve if you're still stuck in the rut from yesterday. How do you, right. how do you solve the new problem today? If you're still trying to wrap your brain around yesterday, right? Absolutely. You've got to get a clear mind. And I can't tell you enough how many times clients come to me and they're stuck on the same thing. And I'm like, we're still talking about the same thing. I'm like, it's a new day. We got to get to the next the next step. And that's where 
the thing with business owners and being a business owner, as you know, and you're so emotionally attached and you don't want it to fail that that's why I tell everyone I have to check emotion at the door because I do watch, I do know the emotion there. And I can tell you that, and it's how you feed your family, you know, it's your livelihood, but you right. have to pull away and you have to check out because if not, you stay in that phone, you stay stuck in it. And eventually it takes on your, it takes over your life. Absolutely. And we're talking about staying stuck at that. And I want to go to the next question, which is, I see so many founders and business owners when they start, they set some kind of goal, right? And I've done this in my life too. They set this goal and they get really close to that goal. And it seems like they run out of gas or they hit a plateau and they're really close to the goal and they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Do you have any tips or tricks to get past that where when you see the light, you get stuck, right? What do you do to, you know, to, to put your dress on or pull your pants up and, and push through and break through that glass ceiling and really thrive in, in your market and in your, in, in your business? So when I look at um, rebuilding, restructuring, whatever it is, you have these partners, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, celebrate every little thing. Growing up, my mom, I always bring in my values and core. You'll read it in my book. You'll hear me talk about it. My, my family, my life, my core values, they shape who I am and they never really change. Um, I've taken them on to the business and corporate world. Um, however, my mom always brought me cake and she said, we don't need anything to celebrate to eat cake. We can just eat cake. I believe in celebrating. My kind of family right there. And, uh, yeah. And I can tell you the crazy <laughs> thing is she's like, she, she spins, you know, she has that orange steer. She's like a, that's like her right. hobby. My mom is the healthiest. She's more fit than any, me, any of us. It's actually crazy, but she loves cake. And, but she taught us to always celebrate the little things and made these little things fun. Right. Right. And the same, it goes through the same in business. You don't have to announce it, but you need to realize those little, look at how far you've come and really celebrate those little things because you're going to have a long day. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have, excuse my language, sh shitty days. Like, right. I mean, and you need to remember those little moments because you have come far. And then when I say you have, when you're rebuilding, there's going to be these partnerships that I really tell everyone. Really having partnerships and bringing them in, they really drive you because if you don't have a lot of mentors and you are a business owner and you haven't found the right mentor that's sticking with you and pushing you and your family may not understand marketing or may not understand the field you're in, if you're an engineer, whatever that is, having those partnerships, they really can drive you because you may have an event coming up or they may send you an email like, hey, we have this new client. We want you involved in this project. Right. Have the that net creating that network and that those partnerships when you're building a company. I always say, and everyone kind of knows this line. I I didn't really build a business as much as I built relationships, and those relationships built my business. Um, and so goes for saying those relationships will drive you. They will empower you. And lastly, be involved in your community and, and mentor people yourself. Because when they look up to you, you'll want to continue to drive right. and it'll push you for success. Fantastic. I want to take your three tips and go backwards with them as just my, my summary of those. And the first one is learn, teach, do. Love mm -hmm. that statement, right? Um, I probably got it from Grace Anatomy. But um, learn, teach, do. I use it um, when I'm choosing captains for my boxing team, right? I'm like, hey, you're going to learn it, you're going to teach it, and then you're going to do it, right? And that's, yeah. that's how we're going to go. So the mentoring people in your community, being part of your community, I think is a huge, huge benefit. Um, but on the second one, you talked about, you know, building relationships. What people don't realize about small business owners and entrepreneurs, that it's a lonely, it's a lonely endeavor that you're in, right? You are doing things that other people don't understand. They don't really know what you're doing. You have a picture of what it's going to be at the end and you can't really describe it to anybody. And you find yourself at family events and things like that. When you're having conversations with them, you can just tell that the people that you're talking to really don't have any concept of what you're talking about or what you're going through. So it's really hard to find people in your in your inner circle that you can even have conversations about what's going on inside your life. So building relationships outside of that with other business people, I think, is wildly important. Yeah. Just so that you can have a conversation with somebody that understands, I need $100,000 next week to pay, make payroll, and I don't know how I'm going to get it. 
right? And your mom doesn't understand that today, right? Yeah, <laughs> or your I best friend doesn't clients. understand that kind of stress. I right? have old clients that, you know, may use me in and out for certain things, but they don't have me, they don't talk to me day in, day out. And I've even called old clients that because what I'm struggling with is what they, they're, that's their, you know, they, they're an right. expert in that field. And that's why I say keeping these relationships, you never, I always say, do not burn bridges. You can burn as many bridges in your personal life and in your life as you want, but do not build burn bridges in your business world right. and business and corporate life, because I can tell you that it will come back to haunt you. Um, yeah, I use yeah. everybody. I mean, I think that's the best is, you know, I feel like a family. Um, some of my partners are, we are family. Like I go to their right. holiday events, things like that. And, you know, they will be with me for, I will thank some of these partners who have supported me when nobody did. Like some of my family were like, I don't know what yeah. you doing. You are this is nuts, right? right. Um, but my partner is solid. They understood. And they wrote a check. They right? They understood it so well. They wrote a check for it too, yeah. right? So and that, yeah. So it's different. You know, it's fantastic. And I always tell people, your partners and those people in your network, they, that's your net. They ca- That's what a network was supposed to be before networking events. So all right. this whole, there's a lot of stigmas that come with it, but it's supposed to be what catches you when you fall. Right. And Absolutely. I really believe that. I just want to touch on your don't burn bridges. I say it all the time. I said, you can, if you burn a bridge, just be well aware that it's really expensive to repair a burnt bridge, right? It's way easier to create a new bridge than it is to repair a burnt one. And that's, uh, you don't want to walk back over that if you burn it. So if you're going to burn that bridge in business, make sure that you're not going to ever try to repair it. You're going to walk away from that relationship and you're never going to get back there. And, and I would say that there are very few reasons that you should burn a bridge in business. Um, and I've burned a couple recently, and those are just with toxic, toxic clients, right? That are, you know, might might have some things that well, they well, do. You have their... to wash your hands. Sometimes so, you have sometimes to put your you hands have to. up, and I think yes. of the emoji. You know, the emoji is like this. You know, I I think sometimes you gotta put your hands up and say, yep, "Done. We're just we're just not gonna do this anymore." I've done done yeah. what I can, but I can't do this anymore. But I, um, I would reserve that for toxic relationships only, right? Yeah. Cut, sever those, get them, burn that bridge and move on with life. But I wouldn't, I would still even not burn it all the way. Maybe with the, the toxic person, not maybe the company, right? Because that company's going to change. I would walk away with your head held high. Like I right. had um, uh, somebody who called me and they're like, I, you know, I did all this work and they want me to refund them. And I said, you know what? Is it work? Because this person makes a substantial amount. They're doing really well. And I said, you know what? Right. Walk, be the bigger person walk away with your head held high because there's new, whether it's God, you believe in having another drink, God, energy, karma, whatever it is you believe in. It comes around. It it comes back to help. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then your first tip was celebrate the wins. And I would call that stacking gratitude. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you, you say celebrate your little wins. And what we do is these little wins, we don't really celebrate them. So we're not grateful for them. And then all we do is we fixate on the negative. And if you, all you're doing is fixating on negative, you will never look at the positive. That's all you'll see in your business. You won't see you'll that feel positive. Buried. You'll just right. feel buried. You'll never, you'll feel like you can't breathe because I can tell you at the end of the day, I still have a laundry list of things I'm saying at my yeah. desk. And I have a laundry list of things that I write down and that are in my emails too. And I can tell you that I would feel buried, but I can say, okay, I can close my office door. And like I said, I'm moving offices right now, but I have can close my doors and I know that I've done this, this, and this today. And I'm, that's it. I'm good. Right. I can walk away. You know? Yep. You're never going to get it all done. That's okay. But no. the stuff that you did accomplish deserves this. It deserves a little celebration, right? You, you yeah. did things today and that, that deserves, it's deserving of celebration. Every right. time you get something done, every time you move forward, every time you, you know, give a employee a little raise or a bonus, those things should be celebrated right and you should really appreciate those because if you don't appreciate those small things you're only going to really look at the negatives and you're going to be stuck in this circular horrible place to live one thing i tell people who struggle to pull away and not celebrate those little things do one thing that you don't want to do so whether it be the phone call go get your license renewed today whether it be calling and talking to your cpa dealing with finance you know the things that no business owner wants to deal with. And a lot of reasons people 
want to work for companies and not have their own company because they don't want to deal with no offense the bullshit that comes with it like right. do one thing every day that you don't want to do and usually those tasks are not the long ones they're like the 10 minute tasks right. that we just as business owners procrastinate put off and put off and you'll feel better you'll it's like when you get off the treadmill you're like damn i do not want to start running and, right and i'll even put a little fuel on that fire to really get yourself used to doing what you say you're going to do yeah. Before you do that task that you don't want to do, say it out loud. I'm going to right. cut the grass, right? And then immediately go cut the grass and get yourself in the habit of doing what you say you're going to do immediately after you say you're going to do it. Get it done, move it off your plate, celebrate that win and go on with the rest of the thing of your life. Right. These people that talk about it and they don't do things just absolutely drive me crazy. And that's why I start, I always write the list down. Because right. everyone has, you have Monday, you have Slack, you have, you have all these different systems that we're all typing our like notes and our list in our, you know, our PAs, our project managers. We're right. all on that. That's great. But I have my own list of shit I really need to get done, both personal, professional, phone calls for both. Like whether it be a doctor appointment or a client call. Right. You need a list every day. And there's something about crossing out as I go during the day with a pen. I'm like, yes, like, there's three things right. today I crossed out. So not everything has to be like so 2020 where we're always on like Monday or, you know, on click right. whatever system you use to tag manage your tasks. Right. Make a list, post a note, whatever you do, so you can feel accomplished at the end of the day and look back and be like, wow. Right. I got something done. If you are I lean really life, heavily on my calendar. Without my calendar, I'd be Actually, without my calendar and three other people looking at it, <laughs> I would be lost. So, um, yeah, I definitely, I don't, I, I can't, my handwriting is horrible, so I don't write anything down. Everything I do is on a computer. Um, so, my yeah, I definitely. My definitely gotten worse since being out of school because it's school you have to write where now we don't. And I'm like, right. damn, I'm like, at least I have to write. I force myself to write in a planner and uh, on these lists every day where I don't know if it would, if it would look good at all. Right. Anymore. So moving on to the very last question of the day, clicks and bricks. We talk about business and technology. We've not really dumped into tech at all today. So is there one piece of technology that you use? It could be a regular basis or, or not even every day, but that you feel that has changed your personal life or your business life in a significant way. Well, number one, um, definitely Google Calendar. I love my Google besides having my calendar that I say I carry around my planner, my Google calendar alerts me. It's reminds me it's like my calendar is super important for that. And then I definitely, if you're in social media or if you're in any type of media that you have to plan, definitely find the right um, system to plan posts because plan your tweets, you know, you can go in and write a tweet. Like if you, if it's off topic or if it comes to you, but having something that you can put in because then I can go in and plan it for the week for my clients, for myself, whatever it is I want to do is right. organized. It's all there. And then you don't have to worry about it. That's number two. And then you don't have this constant, my, Oh, I got to do this. Especially when you start juggling clients or you right. know multiple accounts. Um, and then lastly, I would say definitely if you do outreach, make sure you're using an outreach system that works for you and is updated because a lot of the systems that I have, I've had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time on the weekends researching. And then my little breaks during my days, I would literally spend on calls and demos because the systems are changing. For example, Crass PR, journalists are jumping so from so Twitter to LinkedIn to all these different places right. that you are constantly having to track people down, right? Find them what works best. So really spend that time. If you're talking technology, I tell everyone, um, definitely spend time with the right people. And customer service for technology is everything to me. Like I can tell you that some of the bigger, um, just like Cision and PR Newswire or um, bigger companies like Meltwater, there was a newer startup that is that is definitely coming and they're, built, they're based in Austin and uh, I'm pretty impressed with their customer service. And if I could, I would start to try to get more people to go toward them because I think their customer service is better and I think they're working really hard. 
And you know, that's the thing. The bigger the company, the less they have to care because they've been around for so long. And yeah. so, um, yeah, those are like my, my systems, definitely an outreach system, one solid outreach system you should have. And I mean, we all use Canva. I, kudos to Canva. You guys just got a lot right. more funding. Uh, Canva has definitely been um, a blessing because everyone talks to Adobe and I'm like, oh God, I do not miss using it. I, I don't, Adobe. I, don't I use Adobe still pretty regular. I do use Canva. Um, I prefer PicMonkey over Canva though, personally. Well, and I learned big working with startups and different apps and SaaS companies. I'm sure you've heard of Figma because Figma, a lot of people like design apps and whatnot on Figma. Right. So that's another one. Like I said, there's so many. You really have to find what, if you have a niche, what works in your niche, what certain industries, there's right. better, even, you know, there's better systems for every industry. Right. So, so I, I really like Google Calendar because I like that it syncs with so many different applications. I can have my Google Calendar, it's tied to my Calendarly, okay. and it automatically syncs to my corporate email calendar so that it's all in sync everywhere. It does take some technical chops to set that syncing up everywhere, but um, once it's done, it's a really phenomenal resource. And right. on the outreach, the only thing that I would say on outreach, when you say get a solid outreach, I cannot tell people enough that your script that you're using for outreach, how important it is. Yeah. You can literally on an outreach email campaign, you can literally change one or two words and, and increase your take rate by 50 to 100%. So when you well, first- a lot of people don't even think to run the keyword search. Like if you're, if you're doing yeah. outreach, think of this is where PR, having people in PR not understanding marketing still today, when I walk into these bigger firms and I'm like, how are you not like pairing right. with that? Because that is everything. That is what the company is based on running. Right. You know, it's, yep. it's crazy. So I just finished the book about three weeks ago called hook point. And if you're writing copy for outreach, I think hook point is a phenomenal book to read because it really breaks down the psychology of when you're writing copy, you know, how do you write that copy, making sure that you're hitting, I think it's seven or nine different personality types. I'm not very good at that. I'm not a very good copywriter by far. Um, but, you know, when you're writing ad copy or you're writing copy in these different forms, you know, hook point really gives a lot of great tips and tricks on, on how to break down the psychology of each sentence and how you're going to talk to you know, the emotional person and the adventurous person and, you know, really writing that copy for everybody. And your outreach, I, I've seen email outreach campaigns that change three or four words and they go from a 0% response rate to a 50% response rate. Yeah. Just just that simple, right? So, and I, and I see so many people I always say this, email outreach doesn't work. LinkedIn outreach doesn't work. Facebook marketing doesn't work. And like, well, if you try it once and it fails and you quit, yes, it's not going to work. You've got to create your campaign. You've got your idea. You're going to get information back from the marketplace. You're going to modify it, send it back out, test it again, right? So it, luckily, we live in a world today where you can do those tests for like $20, $30. Whereas, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, those tests were costing ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, right? The, the test the billboard or test the magazine ad. You can test these ads and your ideas today for as little as $10, right? If you understand the KPIs and what your objectives are, you can really do a lot of a lot of damage on these social media marketing campaigns, but you have to be willing to modify it and keep changing it, changing it around. Optimization, like I, like I can't explain enough how, how attention to detail and really follow, the follow-up is what we're lacking, like millennials, I keep like preaching, I feel like to the choir, but like being a millennial, I go back to saying it's bad reputation. I, when I'm talking to my friends or peers or anyone that's come to me for help, I'm like, you have the follow up is everything. You Absolutely. Know? And if it's personalized, whether it needs to be personalized, time, you know, timely, or, you know, just really thought, thought out, like you really need to do that research when you do the follow up. And a lot of times we're in this fast moving market where they're like, oh, I can just throw something out there and it will work. Right. No, actually you, it's not going to work like that anymore. So, you know, I think. There's and on that follow-up, and, and we're running out of time, so I got to wrap yeah. this up. But on the follow-up, I follow a 13 and 30 rule. So 13 contacts in 30 days from the time I get a hot lead. Mm -hmm. And I get this question all the time. When is a lead dead? When they say, stop calling me. 
Right. When the cut, when the when the lead tells you that they're not going to do business with you, that's when that lead is dead, and it's not dead until then. Keep following, and it's not dead then. It's dead for that product, right? You can bring that to that lead to another campaign and start nurturing them somewhere else. So, you know, the lead's never dead. Work it until work it until they tell you to stop working them, right? right. And and I find people give up so frequently in that in that section. How would somebody contact you if they wanted to get in touch? So they can go to the mbline.com. They can go to themadelineelizabeth.com. Um, contact at themadelineelizabeth.com. Um, I will I will definitely respond. Um, I would love to hear from anyone. And uh, I will have links to Calend. Um, on my new website, I will be having links where you can schedule a 15, 30-minute session. Um, and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Uh, problem solving or really if you just have questions for me. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really, really, really appreciate your insight and your input. I had a great time. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, that's it for today's show. Again, if you'd like to join my text line community, it's 314-370-2871. You can ask me any question about business or technology, and I will give you an unfiltered, unbiased opinion um, on whatever your question is. Hopefully I know what it and they're versed in it, but we'll see what happens. Send me your questions. I'll never try to sell you anything on that line. That's it for today, folks, and get to work.